My lady? Must the Fletcher standard be raised today? It's flown each day, my lady. Rain or shine. It's a custom of the house. It has flown each day as an insult to the laces. Only if you let it be. Myself, I oil it up each morning, then go about my work without a glance at it. Until it's time to pull it down again. If no one glances at it, then put this up today. It is my father's birthday. You would best ask your sister about that, my lady. My sister. Come on, come to your grandsire. <laughs> He's a grand lad. <laughs> you spared my features by God's blessing. <laughs> More a lacy than a Fletcher to gaze on. What say you, good wife? Oh, he has a look of all. And none of you, I'd say, Sir Austin. He'll grow to be his own man. It's <laughs> <laughs> clever, Margaret. And what of his education? Is he learning to read the scripture and write his name? Master Cropper has charge of his schooling, but it's early yet. Master Cropper? It has long been the custom that all children raised in this house should come under the steward's tutelage, Sir Austin. It's true. I married your son and was prepared for Master Cropper's careful instruction to embrace all his opinions. Ah. And I took you for a Jesuit, Cropper. <laughs> when is John expected? This evening, in time for prayers. Did you not meet with him in London? Aye, briefly. He was much taken up with Parliament business. What a change in eight years. I remember another coat of arms used to hang there once. Well, we can make amends in some matters. Cropper, Sir Martin's wine cellar. There's a wagon arriving loaded up with his favourite Rhenish. And more besides. <laughs> and I have something else for you. But that shall keep till later. Dear father-in-law, let me show you to your chamber. Joshua? Coming, Sir Fletcher. Bring the Did you hear much case. of our war in Massachusetts? Did you receive all our letters? I one or two. I heard enough to make me weep each night for England. I wish I were 30 years younger. Easy words from a merchant. Richer than Croesus now, with others fighting and winning his war for him. To cling firmly to one's beliefs, making one's peace with God. Give one's enemies and see the human face. Something said by Cromwell, but applies to all of us. Money, buying forgiveness, the human face bought off and God gives his blessing. Has God no memory of those terrible things? Old Joseph, legs shut off. Robbie Townsend, stump for an arm. I've always had respect for you, Walter. Your opinion often helped form my own, but how can you say live and let live? You take a wife, boy. You'll understand. Walter's right. What's done can't be undone. And we want our children born in a world at peace. As do I, Hannah. As do I. Look, Mistress Anne and Mr. Fletcher have done right by us. I've got no quarrel with them now. And what if Sir Thomas come back? And Lord Ferrer with an army to claim back what's rightfully theirs? Who says it's theirs? You're a politician, boy. It's a fair fight and they lost. We lost, I thought. You seem to have changed sides. What? Quiet and down, husband. He means no harm. Here, Dick. Here's a mail down here. What you're saying, then, is that our duty is to them that pays us and gives us food and shelter. That's what I'm saying. Just like it's always been. Time out of mind. Emma? Emma Saltmarsh! Saltmarsh, what are you doing here? I thought you was in Wales. You got Will with you? Will's dead. It was six weeks ago in Pontypris. He was in a tavern. And these four brutes 
My countrymen, I'm ashamed to say, were shouting and cursing the king for a papist murderer. And Will stood up and cried, God save the king. Will you know what he was like? And when he came out, they jumped on him and beat him to death with cudgels. He died for his king. That's what the parson said who buried him. A brave young soldier and a patriot. The poor boy. He was drunk, I suppose. No more than usual on a Friday night. Oh, Dick. Don't you go shouting your mouth off in the alehouse. Will Mistress Fletcher have me back, good wife? I always took good care of her baby. Oh, we'll speak with our child. Will of the Wisp, where are you now, soldier? I loved you. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them the judgments written this honor have all his saints praise ye the lord Praise Friends, to mark my father's safe return from the colony of Massachusetts, delivered by God's mercy from all dangers, I beg you will stay. Join us in some refreshment. Master Crupper, fetch out some wine. We have a plentiful supply, I'm told. Indeed, sir. And for the servants, a tankard of ale for the men, a half measure for the women should stay within the bounds of sobriety. Hugh. You've set up a goodly house, my boy. They're all for Parliament now, are they? Well, if they were, Father, that would indeed be the work of Providence. But I pray they come nearer to us with each day that passes. Is it true, Sir Austin, that the Civil War spread even to the coast of America? I, Mr. Lamb, a sea battle in the Bay of Chesapeake between a Parliament ship from London and a King's ship out of Bristol. And who did the Indians cheer for? Ah. They had their own carnage in mind. They massacred hundreds of tobacco planters shortly after and took their scalps to adorn their lodges. But what of England, child? What's your view of it? It is full of misery. Not far off my opinion of it either. My sister has reason to be unhappy, Sir Austin. Her husband, Lord Ferrer, is an exile in France. Fighting for God and King. Aye. Well, uh, I see no reason why the king should not regain his throne. Is not that General Cromwell's view? Indeed, Father, were it possible. Parliament has no wish to destroy the monarchy. It would be fools if they did. There's been a king by custom since long before the conquest, and the people of England wouldn't have it otherwise. You were ever one for custom and history. I remember you with my father when you came here for my wedding vows. I remember also. So why did you turn against him? L Lucinda. No, let him answer. He is for custom and history and a king. We have them all. My father died defending them. <laughs> if it were that simple. It is to me. Uh, Lucinda, this is not the night for argument. And I have to speak I to you on another to, uh, matter. Present this later. But to set that child's mind at ease and to show my esteem for her father, I'll set it on the table, Joshua. For all who wish to see. I was given word in London where it might be purchased. There's only one place it belongs, on the wall from which it was taken. I accept it with my blessing. It is indeed most thoughtful of you, Father. I'm sure Anne and Lucinda... Sir Martin Lacey. Is that Sir Martin Lacey? Is all who knew and 
served, Sir Martin. Sir, would you provoke God's wrath and displeasure by such an act? That is the face of a known malignant. I beg you to be silent, Mr. Lamont. Lamont. Remember, you are a guest in my house. My father's house. Master Cropper, would you be good enough to remove the portrait to your room? But it will hang in the gallery. The steward's room. For the present. As you wish. Forgive me if I do not stay to partake of your hospitality, Mr. Fletcher. I am much disturbed. Have a good night. Magnanimous in victory, son. That's what Parliament must be. And I see precious little evidence of it in the countryside. I see broken limbs and empty bellies, and dull-eyed soldiers unfit for battle, religious quarrels, and Parliament and your Cromwell irresolute in dealing with them. You can't have the king rot away in Carisbrook Castle. You'll have those royalist exiles storming back across the channel with respect to my young lady Farah, spilling more blood and undoing all that our people fought and died for. Father, you've been away these six years. Now much has happened that you can but judge on the evidence of rumour. Don't give me life! Let me out, I pray you! All of you. And in six years, thousands were slaughtered, no matter on which side. It is now the responsibility of Parliament, with God's guiding hand, to set the course ahead. Now, you say we are irresolute. What would you have us do? Wield an iron fist, crush all liberties? It is easy. It's the tyrant's way. We could begin with the king himself, bring him to justice. There are many urging it from the army and within Parliament itself. But there are those of us, with Cromwell, who choose a quieter way, tempered with reason and mercy. For months we have parleyed with this king, but find he is treating with the Scots to bring a mighty army out of the north to spill more blood. He is untrustworthy, a dissembler whose heart God has hardened and who has contempt for his own subjects. In spite of this, we shall remain patient and continue our efforts to reason with him. And those exiles across the water, that bedraggled band of men. We're weary of fighting. We wish only for peace and deliverance from our tribulations. I too see the country's ills and the empty bellies, Father. You think I wish it so? And the customs and traditions that you so hanker for, you think, I wish to see them bedded. You wrong me, grievously. By all means, restore your lost friend, Sir Martin, whom I held in high esteem. And as a part of this house, whatever his. Place him where you will. But God gave us this victory. We stand by his divine will. Do not blame us for the state of England. Lucinda, I must speak with you. Time in Parliament has served you well, John. You make a pretty speech. Lucinda! I would that Edward or Tom were here to answer it. Your wish to have your husband back in England has been granted by the will of Parliament. The King has requested that Lord Ferrer attend him in person while he is confined on the Isle of Wight. Now, Parliament has given its consent that you should travel abroad under our protection, find him and bring him back. Do you know his whereabouts? I know where Tom is. I had a letter from him this very morning. Well, do you have many letters from abroad? Several. How are they delivered? Oh, dear sister, do you think me so simple as to tell you? The Queen's Court is at present at Saint-Germain. Yes, some I know. miles north of Paris. How is Tom? 
He is as well as a gentleman, maybe, that has no money. Lucinda, you are willing to make this journey. How should I be? It is a palpable trick. I have pledges here to say it is not. The King's own seal and Parliament's reply. Pledges? You will demand that Edward swears loyalty to Parliament and you'll seize his property. <sighs> or you would have me deliver him like a lamb to slaughter. Uh, you misunderstand. We've no wish to trap the exiles. We're quite content they should live abroad where they can do but little harm. Lucinda, is it not your heart's desire to meet with Edward again? And see Tom also. I wish to see my husband more than any other thing on earth. I'll make good your request. A request from Parliament and the King. But I cannot guarantee his answer. Some money for your journey. And something for Tom if he's in need. Now, I've arranged for you to leave for Portsmouth in the morning where a ship is waiting. Now, whom do you wish to attend you? I advise Dick Skinner. Or Hugh Brandon. I think Skinner would offer more protection should any uh, difficulties arise. As you wish. And take Emma as your maid. Yes. I've heard she's back in the house. She is. A widow. A journey abroad will bring some relief in her troubles. Quite so. Lucinda. May God protect you. And give you safe passage. I cannot take from the Fletcher coffers, not a penny. That would be theft. He's won you over too, has he, Cropper? That is unworthy of you, my lady. Margaret, please tell Mr. Cropper that in spite of Mr. Fletcher's generosity, Sir Thomas is starving in rags. England is starving in exile. And there can be no hope of restitution of this house or anything without money. Is it scruples holds you back? Or fear of discovery, Master Cropper? Both, good wife, if you wish the truth. Mr. Fletcher is a most diligent bookkeeper. He would uncover it at once. Then let us arrange a theft with your eye turned. And have me accused of negligence. Oh, it is more than my pride will allow. And where's your pride now in this God-infested house? Lucinda! I will not have him speak of the Almighty like that. He's not our God, but some avenging stranger who has no mercy for the vanquished. If you will not help me, Crop, then do it for my father. Can you look him in the eye and deny his son in his hour of need? These are emotional contentions, woman's words. They do not meet the practicalities. The practicalities are, Master Cropper, that you find me Lady Coin for me to sew this night into her gown and you'll not be discovered. Passports, the name of the ship and its captain, and this, your journey through France. Yes. My Lady Ferrer is in your safe keeping, mate. Eh? I'll guard her with my life, sir. It's a great honor you bestow on me. <laughs> I know more than you deserve. I've noted you. You and Walter Jackman both have made light of the difficulties of adjustment. Thank you, sir. Has Lady Fedder told you the purpose of your journey? Only that we're going to Paris, and as like as not, we'll meet Lord Ferrer and Sir Thomas, and maybe even Prince Charles. So you're going on Parliament business, Dick. You will see and hear much of interest. Can you read? I see. Though most of my life is out in the fields, I've taught myself to read and write. Do you own a Bible? Not so to speak of, sir. Now you have one. Read it. In quiet moments each day, you will find much to guide and comfort you. Lucinda, will you take this letter for me to Tom? It's foolish. I was up half the night composing it. 
Make the journey with me. My husband would thank me well for that. He should not mind. You could act as a spy. I'm told there are several ladies at Saint-Germain doing that already. You spoke of Tom's need for money. Give him this ruby. Secure it fast. Indeed, let me sew it quickly into your gown. No, no. Emma shall do it on our journey. Thank you. It'll pay his debts. Goodbye, sister. <laughs> Forgive my ill temper. It was my husband's absence, as much as your politics caused them. Enjoy him while you may. God protect you. is not from any school of swordsmanship that I've ever attended. I learned it in Aleppo once from a malignant and a turban Turk <laughs> that instruct a poor malignant Englishman in the use of it. When you've paid me the 20 pieces for this. And for the cards last night. Edward, let me some money to pay the old rogue. You should presently be left with nothing but my christening knife. <laughs> what have you grown, melancholy? In this deadly place, Lucinda. Oh, oh, my dearest husband. And Tom. Oh, my sister. I thought that old man would kill you. No, it was sport. There's a wager between us. You have time for sport. There is little time for sport in England. How did you find us? Have you escaped from England? I come on Parliament business. And I... and I see that you're not short of company. <laughs> come with me and rest. And tell me everything. Hey! Sir Thomas. Glad to see you alive and well, sir. And Emma. Is Will here also? Will Saltmarsh is dead, sir. Dead? He died for his king, sir. Poor dear Will. I drink to a brave man and a faithful friend. He saved my life when we took the silver to Oxford. I remember. Mm, thank you, Emma. for me. Oh. Oh, spare your pain, look, for John and Master Crop. It's all they would allow. Well, you give it to your husband. I owe him six times as much. This I bring from Anne. A ruby. There is still love between us. Tom. Will you read these documents? Give me your advice. Lucinda, what make you of this? I do not know. They swear it is no trick but a straight request from the king himself for you to attend him. It is the king's seal, and Speaker Lentil himself has put his name to it. And uh, you are to escort him home? It is a bad moment. We are waiting orders to sail for the Essex coast. 
Not for what purpose? To take up arms again. The time is ripe for this. We have reports daily. Cromwell's army is half disbanded, rent with faction, and Parliament itself is fatally divided. Tom, I've heard no talk of royalist uprisal in England. Oh, I believe that there was exhaustion and indifference everywhere. Not so. Our friends lie in wait, ready to join with the Scots marching south. I must take counsel of the Queen. Edward, I have it on good report that a fair young lady has arrived from England and is in need of refreshment. Sir Ralph Winter, my lady. Companion in distress, these young cavaliers, and a dear friend of your late and most lamented father. You must excuse me, Sir Ralph. I have pressing matters to attend. But pray, remain. <laughs> He's a worthy fellow. Ah, but do not make the mistake of playing with him at cards. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I am honoured to meet you, Sir Ralph. But I'm afraid I do not ever recall seeing you at Arnskirt. It is doubtful that you would, since the last time I was there, you were but a babe in arms, dangling upon my knee. But Tom remembers me. I taught him how to shoot bow. Sir Ralph spent our growing years mostly abroad. Fighting for the Protestant cause against the Turkish infidels. Oh. And my wife. My dear Lucinda, do not look so startled. Is it not a woman's prerogative to change her mind? Cousin Susan has seen the error of her ways since last she was at Arnscott. Under the guidance and most excellent tutelage of my dear and noble lord. You must forgive me, cousin. The last I saw was the back of you leaving Arnscott, with the scorn of roundhead laughter in your ears. And I deserved it. My life then was worthy of your reproach. I did much that I bitterly regret. And I can only beg your forgiveness, as others have forgiven me. There now. Friends all. United in our common purpose. And down with all Parliament rogues and committees. God save the King. God save the King. God save the King. My brother has lost all reason. I know little of the lady's past. You care less. Sir Ralph Winter. Is a lecherous old fool. Lecherous? Old even. But no fool. He has one of the sharpest brains among us. Which counts for nothing if all your plans are dispatched to Parliament. My sister says your court is teeming with spies. I do not doubt that sweet cousin Susan is one of them. We have our spies too. And in the Parliament House itself. I assure you, my sweet, nothing is known of our intentions. Still, I fear this military venture. Tom is changed, flushed with wine and debts. What you see in him is not debauchery. <laughs> well, not excessive it. But summoning up the blood for battle tomorrow, when I shall be returning with you to Arnscott and to service of the king. Oh. It is the queen's wish. I have letters to take and another reason. The young Prince Charles waits in the channel with the fleet. There's a good chance the king can make his escape with my assistance. <laughs> so you have fulfilled your mission, my sweetheart. Shall I come with you to the king? No. You wait at Arnsgood. As I always must. This was not my picture of marriage, my lord. Dear sweet Lucinda. We married in evil times. Even our wedding had the enemy at the door. <laughs> I remember well enough. But may we at least take a leisurely route home. A day or two at most. I cannot neglect my duty. Indeed you cannot. You cannot neglect your duty to your wife. Salt Marsh. <laughs> it's only the Prince of Wales come to cuddle. Oh, Dick, don't call me Widow Salt Marsh. The truth is, 
I never married him. We never had the time. <laughs> <laughs> at a distressing time, Edward. War has broken out again in Wales, Kent and Essex. Cromwell and Fairfax are even now marching to crush the insurgents. Am I not now committed to join the King? Parliament does not break its pledges, sir! You will go to Caddisbrook, and you might make it your business to inform the King that he has turned the common people against him forever by this latest violence. Can you not see that all hope for you is lost? Why do you people so willfully ignore the lessons of providence? This is no time for speeches, I'm for London. To help save what's left of English trade. May I come with you, Sir Austin? I have no wish to stay here while my husband attends the King. I have no objection. You're welcome to my home. Go. I'm not your keeper. Sergeant Swan, there is little danger the war will touch us here, but keep your men up to the mark and be watchful. We're prepared, sir, as God is our judge. Edward. Please. As a member of your own family, Edward, I urge you. Take the negative oath and thus forswear all enmity to Parliament while you have this chance. Was that a condition of my return? If so, I take my leave at once. Look, I cannot compel you. But you have a wife to consider. And now is it not good policy My wife is my sake. business, Mr. Fletcher. If I take your oath, how would I present myself to my king? As just another jailer. I must warn you, if you are party to any attempt by the king to escape, it will be the tower for you. And when, by God's grace, he shall escape and be restored to his rightful dignity on the throne of England, it will be the tower for you. Enough! From both of you. I will not hear these words in my house. Edward, is Tom part of this new unrest, or is he safe in France? I have no idea of his whereabouts. But he knows where his duty lies. I must leave for London within the hour. You will accompany me under escort. <laughs> I am your prisoner. I shall need a manservant. Can you spare one from the house? Dick Skinner, serve your needs. Aye. If he is willing to serve his king. May you heed my Lord Ferris' words, Dick? What's your answer? A simple man, sir. Peace is all I seek, and honest service. I should deem it an honour to serve you, my lord, and his majesty. Well, boy, been over to France, heard both sides of the argument. Mr Fletcher's given you a Bible, and now you're attending the king himself. God certainly marked you out for advancement. What are your feelings now? I'm for peace, Walter. Same as you are. The question is... How we achieve it. There won't be no peace now till they chop the heads of Cromwell and the King. Oh, God strikes them both with thunderbolts. That's blasphemy. Hey, what's that been left for? The boy's got no appetite today with all the upset. Threw half of it at his grand sale in a tantrum. <laughs> you going now, Dick? Aye. You won't see me for a while. None of you. Take care of yourself. 
touching him like that for? Well, so much not yet cold in his grave. Rachel. What did you do with him in France? Hands off Rachel. me, you dirty slut! Stole! <laughs> Leave me be! <laughs> That's another choice you've got to make, boy! You best be off, I say! <laughs> Nothing to concern you, girl. That's right. You got work to do. One word, woman, and it's your law. Rachel! Sir Thomas? Release her, Ralph. She was my father's cook these 20 years. I doubt she has turned pure. I think you were for it, Tom. But she feeds my pious bellies. Rachel, I cannot move easily. Rouse good wife, Margaret, and Mr. Cropper, quick. And silent, damn you! Hugh? Did you hear a noise? Yes, I heard something, mistress. Swan, Mr. Jackman. Open up in the name of God and Parliament. George Swan, you'll wake the dead. What's your business? Well, open up and I'll tell you. You'll tell me from where you're standing, boy. Sergeant, I am, Mr. Jackman. Open up or you'll be in trouble if you don't. I'll be in trouble if I do with my wife, boy. She's brought to bed with child. You'll give her twins. Now stay your business and I'll tell you if I'll open up. Two men have been let through this gate. I say they're royalist scum running away from battle, and I demand a search of this castle. Royalists? Boy, you better catch her. But I heard nothing. Who reported this? Mayfield. Step forward, boy. Speak. White horse sergeant come toward this gate. Then I saw it gallop off, empty saddled. A white horse, you say? Well, that'll be the ghost, young lad. I don't mean to frighten you, but the summer's seen the ghost of Sir Martin Lacey on nights with full moon. Come back to defend his castle against the Ironsides. Two men, the boy saw. By each sergeant were too definite and no ghost, I don't think. Two, I can't explain. Unless it were his son with him, Sir Thomas, from this ladies' war. You want to look around? Not safe to stay in the castle. You must go by the secret passage from the wine cellar to the crypt of the church. Excellent. Wine cellar? <laughs> Margaret, bring some cloth and some warm water to staunch this wound. Harry, I'll follow you then. You swear you saw and heard nothing? Not a sound. And I've been pacing up and down here like anxious father. If you're lying, Mr. Jackman. I know the consequences. Right, lads. Outside. Sir Martin, you say? Father and son now. Bustling about so late. What are you carrying? Uh, dressings for, for Master Cropper's gout, Mistress. It, it's paining him tonight. Is it your custom to treat Cropper's gout? It's part of my duties to treat anyone who suffers in this house. It's always been so. From your own ailments as a child. Very well. Go to it.
<laughs> Who's in the house? Is Mr. Fletcher here? Mr. Fletcher is mercifully in London, sir. My sisters? Lady Ferrar also, staying with Sir Austin. My Lord Ferrar rides to join the King. <laughs> Only your sister Anne is at home, sir. Yes, and I fear we've disturbed her. <sighs> it's, uh, it's near where my father received his wound. <laughs> Not so bad, I think. <laughs> I was shot. Escaping from culture, sir. And I owe my life to Sir Ralph. I have acquired a bottle of Rhenish on my way through. And ah. if I may be permitted to open it, Master Stewart, it should speed recovery all round. Ah. Laces were ever hospitable, Sir Ralph. What will you do now? I fear the morning light will bring discovery. From our zealous new preacher. We must be gone by then. Shh, don't wriggle about. Is Walter Jackman here? He could arrange a cart for us. And we shall transport ourselves to an old lady love of mine, Lady Peg Welton, who will give us succor, I doubt not. We shall not stay here chattering. I will go and speak with Mr. Jackman. Come, Hugh. Cropper. My sister Anne. I should like to see her. I beg you, no, no sir. Most no, no, ill-advised. Why? Is my twin's heart so hardened against me? I think not. Hugh, extend the invitation to her. If she refuses, tell her I understand and send her my love. Go, quickly. It is impossible. Where, Sir Hugh? In the crypt, mistress. Crypt? I cannot go to him. Send him away at once. He's wounded and near starvation after two days and nights on the road. He asks for me. Dare he? And what is this secret passage you talk of? I'll lead you, mistress. You cannot ask it of me tonight. But it is Sir Thomas. And I thought you were a man for the quiet life. Oh. Curse your interference. It is not I, but the war which interferes. Curse that too. <coughs> Wait a year. <coughs> oh, a stubborn one, like Mistress Lucinda. Took all night, she did. My love. <coughs> Mr. Cropper. Easy, easy. Sir Thomas here, an answer. That's where the spirit him away. But I'll not go if you say not. You and the babe come first, my love. It's not Dick Skinner you have to convince. I'm not thinking of that. I'm thinking if I'm caught, our future. But if Sir Thomas is caught, because of your neglect and your, your devotion to me. How would we live in the knowledge of that? What future then? Ah! I know you love me. You don't have to prove it. Go! Do what you must do! Ah! Minty! Mother speaks truth. Ah! as much good as a fart in a forest here, Walter Jackman. Ah! So. Sleep. He needs a surgeon. And you'll have one tomorrow. If ever we get out of this catacomb. I could have kept myself from you. But I wish to thank you for the jewel. Which saved the lacy honor. Do not speak so much. I would have you removed from here, but I cannot. Will you tell your husband of my visit? Would you have me tell him? 
I am most displeased with you. <laughs> you take cruel advantage of ah, me. A war cannot divide you and I. Fear not, Walter Jackman will see us gone by daybreak. I, I must go. Go. And say you dreamed me. But one thing, you must not punish those who've helped me. Margaret, Hugh, or any others. On our father's tomb, you must not. Shall be most severe with you, if you do. Two men on the one horse. But did you see their faces, boy? Not clear, sir. It was a clear night. What's the soldier's name, Sergeant? Mayfield, sir. Well, you're something young for night watch. Come here, boy. Now, tell me straight. Have you ever looked on the face of Sir Thomas Lacey? Aye, sir, but once at your wedding. Mr. Fletcher. You're up late, Cropper. I was reading, sir. I cannot sleep at night, sir. I have pain, the gout. General Cromwell has the gout. Does not Minty give you remedies? None that work for me. We were not expecting you home, sir. Were you not? Fetch Margaret to rouse my wife. I am here, husband. Is the entire house awake and dressed? It's gone midnight. <laughs> my sweet. What brings you back at such an hour? Intelligence, Anne, brought to me as I sat in council that your brother escaped from Colchester two days ago with a notorious malignant, Sir Ralph Winter. Both were headed west on the one horse, and now my sergeant here informs me that one horse and two riders were seen outside this castle gate not two hours since and then vanished into thin air. Well, if they're here, we shall find them. Have you heard any disturbance? None. I should be the first to hear of anything, sir. The house has been quiet as a tomb all night. And you, my love, you were uh, not yet in bed. I was in the parlour, writing. Hugh was with me. But you came just now from the kitchen. I went for some refreshment. But I was distracted by your arrival. And before that, none of you heard anything? Nothing. Are you sure? I have told you. Do you not believe me? Of course I believe you. Shall I bring in the guard, sir? Yes. You shall not, Sergeant! Those days are past. Would you have our son scarred by such a memory? I had not intended to search the nursery. You might do worse than start with your bailiff, Mr. Jackman, sir. Walter Jackman? His house is hard by the back gate, and he seemed shifty when we questioned him. Very well. Have your men assembled by the gate, presently. Uh, Mr. Fletcher, sir, with respect. Mr. Jackman's wife, Hannah, is even now being delivered of a child. A, a difficult birth. I'm given to understand. Your anxiety is noted, Cropper. We shall be mindful of mother and child. I wished a word with Mr. Jackman. Right here behind you, sir. Proud father was taken in a gulp of God's good night air. Which leaves you short of breath. Mr. Jackman, Sir Thomas Lacey was here at Arnscott tonight. Well, that may be the word of some, sir, but I've not seen him. If I learn 
that you have helped in his escape. I will not hesitate to have you dismissed, mother, child and all. And I'd expect no less, sir, as your servant. Pray you let me see my child now. I want to see your son. Will you share a jug of ale with us, Mr. Fletcher? Uh, by way of celebration. No, uh, I'll leave you in peace. Good night to you. All. Good night, sir. did for us, gal. He has, Brent. Sending me out on that fool errand. But the task is done. Aye. Both tasks. Well done. 